thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me here today and for the, the kind introduction. Can everybody hear? OK, great. OK. Um, so I, I'm going to talk um, a little bit about the global health security agenda. I, don't, I missed yesterday. I apologize. So if it's come up already and there are things you already know, um, definitely will, uh, I'll be able to answer as many questions as you have. But I'm also going to highlight some of the challenges um, with, with the global health security agenda concept and why we launched it in the first place. And then also some of the opportunities that I think we now have with this agenda and also um, highlighted by the Ebola epidemic, which we'll be talking about in the next session. So I wanted to, to pause for just a second uh, to actually look at the quote on the first slide, which is something usually the first slide is sort of a throwaway. Here's a, a reason we should care about this. But this quote actually highlights one of the key challenges that we created the global health security agenda to address. Um, to start thinking about infectious disease <laughs> threats and biological threats writ large as security threats. Um, we've now heard President Obama and global leaders around the world um, say that the Ebola epidemic represents a national security threat. Um, not just a health threat or an economic threat, but indeed a, a threat to peace and security. And that actually has been a tough concept for many countries around the world to embrace. In our own country, um, the anthrax attacks in particular brought together our communities, multi-sectoral pieces of government, whole of government, um, whole of society approaches around the biological threat, and the president's national strategy for countering biological threats, which was released in 2009, talks very poignantly about the need to bring health and security together. But when we started talking about this agenda about two years ago, even within um, some sectors of society in the, in the US, this concept that bio, biological threats require a national security component um, was still a little bit of a challenge. And it's also important because national security and threats to peace and security are what get leaders interested in, in thinking about challenges. And it's also what brings a huge whole of society approach sometimes to the table. So I put that as the backdrop um, to think about as I, as I move forward. So the Global Health Security Agenda was launched in February of this year, and it was launched before the first cases of Ebola, which had already been occurring in Guinea, really came into, the, into public view. Um, it was launched um, with a very simple but very ambitious vision, which is to attain a world safe and secure from global health threats posed by infectious diseases. So this is the goal, and the goal is really to make progress on this in an accelerated fashion. The GHSA is not an entity in and of itself. It's not a treaty. It's not, it's not the IHR. It's not intended to replace the WHO international health regulations. It's intended to bring a coalition of willing partners together in a whole of government and whole of society approach to accelerate progress towards this goal. Blah. Let me try one more time, sorry. Yeah. There we go. Sorry about that. So why global health security? This is a question that I think it's it, um, actually looking at the headlines today, it's actually kind of funny to even for me to even ask this question right now, given what's going on in West Africa. But I, I leave it up here as a reminder that when I created this slide uh, in probably this particular slide in the beginnings of it back in January, it actually wasn't. Um, a novel concept to put this as a question on the slide. So a lot has changed in the past several months. Um, in, indeed, most of the bullets on here, today's interconnected world, the fact that we're interconnected and that disease threats anywhere are, are a threat to everyone everywhere, um, has played out again and again over the last several weeks in, in the news. But it's worth noting that the international health regulations, the revised version, <clears throat> were put into place in 2005 um, and we're still at a point now where in 2014 most countries in the world cannot actually meet the core capacities required by this ambitious document. Um, and to put a really fine point on it, in 2012 when we started talking within the U.S. government about the need for an agenda, an acceleration approach of some kind, 80% um, of countries reported that they couldn't make the WHO deadline in June of 2012 um, to meet the core capacities. This was really a wake-up call. It was a wake-up call for WHO. 
It was a wake-up call for our partners, and it was a wake-up call for, for us in the governmental sector, and, and many of you I know as well, in the non-governmental and, and public-private uh, partnership world, that we needed to do something about this. Um, we were looking at a situation where SARS cost the world an estimated $30 billion. The anthrax attacks cost another billion. <coughs> Untold other disease outbreaks and threats have cost billions in, in lives and, and human, human cost and, and to the economy. And we're looking at the Ebola epidemic um, will certainly cost billions before all is said and done. But we haven't managed to coalesce around a way to actually get these capacities in place, working with partner countries in an organized and systematic way. And so that's what the global health security agenda is all about. And that's the, the major challenge um, that we're facing. I'd also like to pause for a second on branding, because I think in a room full of, of people like this, it's important to talk about things like this. Um, IHR is not a particularly it's not a particularly catchy brand at the leadership level. It sounds like something the health ministers should be focusing on, and they should. Uh, but it doesn't sound like something that leaders of the world should, should get out and rally themselves uh, around. And it, it, in the, and it hasn't been something they've been able to rally themselves around. And I think one of those reasons is because of branding. I think another major reason is because it's hard. It's really hard. And it, it, in, it involves more than just health ministers. You need finance ministers, the development sector, defense ministers, you need to have the agriculture community. Everybody has to come together to actually get this done, and that's really hard to do. It's hard in this country. It's hard in every country. <clears throat> but we have to do it. So when we launched the agenda in February, um, Secretary Sebelius um, Carey and Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, Lisa Monaco, penned an op-ed. And it's actually, I think, worth reading um, this quote because it, it it gives, at least to me, every time I read it, a sense of how bold this agenda is, but also how many sectors are actually involved in achieving it. <clears throat> New diseases are inevitable, but in the 21st century, we have the tools to greatly reduce the threat posed by global epidemics. We can put in place a safe, secure, globally linked, interoperable system to prevent disease threats, detect outbreaks in real time, and share information and expertise to respond effectively. <clears throat> so this is bold. This is where we're going, and this is where we have to go. So the agenda itself is really built upon three risks, three opportunities, and three priorities. And I have to give credit where credit is due. This is one of my favorite slides, but it belongs to CDC Director uh, Frieden, and he, he's let me use it um, many times. I think it really explains very well what the global health security agenda is all about. Um, the three risks that it's built on, emerging infectious disease threats, <coughs> drug resistance, and the risks posed by bioterrorism, intentional creation of disease. Three opportunities that we have, and I think first and foremost right now, we've probably never had more societal commitment than we have right now to um, rally around this agenda. And it's important uh, to think about how, how we do that and how we make sure that the funding that's going into the Ebola epidemic also translates into long-term sustainable capacity for that region. We have new technologies and an incredible continued sustained interest in how technology can help achieve this agenda. And then success leads to success. And what this means is we have a lot of pilot projects. We have a lot of successful models that have been implemented over the past decade and beyond. Um, and really figuring out a way to take those successes and to use a phrase that, that my friend Scott Dow has used on many occasions, we need to franchise it. We need to figure out ways to, to work successfully with partners and franchise models adopting to the culture um, within specific countries to be able to actually build that success more quickly and more systematically. And then the three priorities that we're focusing on, preventing threats wherever possible, detecting rapidly, and responding effectively. So the agenda itself, um, this is the short version. There's um, handouts in the back with the actual agenda and also the targets that the US government has set for itself in achieving the objectives of the agenda. This is also posted, and all of the documents that I'm going to talk about or have referenced are posted um, on the CDC Global Health Security Agenda website. So you, very easy to find and navigate. Um, but just to, to give a sense of, of some of these um, objectives, we're talking about things like effective emergency operations centers, 
um, which have been so critical in the Ebola response, um, especially in, in places like Nigeria, where, where they were able to successfully manage the disease and the emergency operations center that was already in place. Um, for polio, actually, was very help with polio dollars was actually very helpful in in managing, helping them get a jump start on managing that 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 outbreak. Um, we're talking about disease surveillance systems that are able to detect and report um, in what approximates real time, which we haven't achieved as a globe, but which we have the technology to do. Um, strengthening laboratory systems, the ability to detect quickly, also critical in the Ebola response. Trained biosurveillance workforce, so we're talking about epidemiologists who can do contact tracing, who can get out there and, and, and do the spade work that's needed in order to prevent, uh, detect, and respond. We're talking about national biosecurity and biosafety systems um, and a multitude of, of other issues. Um, antimicrobial resistance also very high on the agenda of many of the countries working on this. So just a smattering of things, but these are, these are, this is plain language, but it is not reinventing the IHR. And it is also not, re, it is not leaving out the performance of veterinary services pathway on the animal health side either, nor the AMR issue, which is not captured in the IHR, but which is the subject of a global action plan being drafted right now with WHO in its own right. So just a, a little bit about um, the agenda itself and sort of the progression of events before I close. I'll also highlight a few more challenges and sort of where we're going with this um, going forward. So we launched the agenda, as I mentioned, in February. Um, I highlight uh, this slide um, also as another way to show you. We have Secretary Sebelius talking with our Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor, Lisa Monaco. We have Director General Chan. We, we need to have all of these sectors coming together and, and many more. We also had a, a big discussion with the non-governmental community the week before this launch to share information, to start to, to get interest in, in, in that community, and to start to build some of the partnerships we're going to need to make this successful. During this event, we challenged countries to make a new concrete commitment to one or more elements of the agenda to implement nationally, regionally, or globally, depending on capability and, 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 um, and financial ability. And then we challenged those countries to come back to Washington in September um, for a meeting at the White House, which I'll tell you about in a minute, to go through the progress that's been made and talk about next steps. In the intervening time, um, the government of Finland hosted in May a commitment development meeting to build on that call for commitments. Um, about 200 people attended in Helsinki with over 30 countries. And we, had over th we had 30 partners at the launch. They in increased that number. And then the government of Indonesia hosted another commitment development meeting in Jakarta in August to, again, build numbers to get more regional involvement. Um, and they hosted a two-day session um, that focused on zoonotic disease threats and then also how do we get to more concrete um, actions. In the intervening time between February and September, partner countries, over 40 partner countries, um, decided to make concrete commitments. We got over 100 commitments to different elements of the agenda. And we also got commitments to develop action packages or lines of effort around 11 different pieces. There are nine objectives. Some of them include more than one thing. So that totaled 11 different areas. Um, and on September 26th in Washington, um, we came back together and actually published those action packages um, that had been developed in the intervening time by these 40-some countries. Um, those action packages include draft targets and indicators for how to actually achieve that objective, which is really important. The international health regulations um, require a self-report from countries, which is, which is a very good thing. But there isn't an external mechanism for actually measuring whether you've been able to achieve that capacity and sustain <coughs> it over time. And this is something that many members of the global health security agenda have recognized as a a shortcoming and something that we, we really want to work closely with WHO and others to come up with a way um, that is transparent and includes the possibility for independent um, assessment. So at the White House on the 26th, um, the President spoke, um, the President Obama, National Security Advisor Rice, and Secretaries Kerry, uh, Burwell, and Hagel all came together with uh, partners from different ministries from 44 countries, including the US, so 43 other countries, announced 100 commitments. Some new commitments were actually made at the meeting itself. And really, it was about 
building on action, and also with the backdrop of the Ebola epidemic and the UN General Assembly um, session on Ebola and the Security Council session on Ebola within the last week before this event, focusing on how can we actually do this so we can prevent what's happening in West Africa from ever happening again. So the U.S. made a bold commitment to the agenda itself. And our commitment is to assist 30 countries, at least 30 countries, over the next five years towards 12 specific targets. So I told you there were 11 action groupings, action packages um, that countries are working on. We have 12 targets. Um, some of the countries decided to merge two of those together. So that's why the discrepancy you'll see in some of our documentation. Um, but we have 12 specific targets that we've announced, and we've published them, and they're in, on the two-pager in, in the back of the room. Um, and we've agreed that we're actually going to measure ourselves and our ability to assist these countries against that, that number. To ward off one question, we do not have a map out of what all of those 30 countries are going to be over the next five years. And some of that has to do with the programs that are involved. So we're talking about CDC, we're talking about USAID, we're talking about DOD's Cooperative Bioengagement Program and State's Biosecurity Engagement Program. We're talking about USDA um, playing a role through its Ag Research Service and APHIS. Um, so these programs are working together um, to determine how we're going to move forward um, in these countries and how we're going to do something else that's a huge challenge, which is actually get funding streams aligned around common objectives so that we can end up with capacity that's measurable in the end. And we have many successes in the US government of being able to do that, but this is a systematic approach towards these 12 targets. So just as an example, and these are, again, published online. Um, in the form that they're currently in, just to give you a sense of the multitude of different countries working together on these action areas. These are three examples, um, one from prevent, one from detect, and one from respond. And in the left-hand column, the middle column, sorry, you have the leaders, so countries self-selected themselves to lead in these areas. And then you have countries that have self-selected themselves to contribute. Um, so for, the, for example, we have for lab detection, the United States, Thailand, and South Africa are working together on, on this action package. And then we have a multitude of countries that have decided to work with us. These leaders are actually having calls um, within the action package and then with all action package leaders. And one of the, the big challenges that we have going forward, and I think it's probably a challenge for all of the groups that we'll talk today, is governance and how do we move this all forward? How do we take this incredible interest and leadership at the expert level and translate it into progress that can be measurable against targets and objectives. And so um, we launched a, st a steering group um, in September, which Finland has agreed to chair in 2015. And Finland and Indonesia and the United States are going to act as sort of a trio or troika. And then there's 10 total countries which are listed on the left. And you can see that this is actually a no mean feat. And none of these countries were coerced. They all agreed very readily, in fact, to be part of the steering group. And some of them actually volunteered and said that they wanted to be part of it. Um, so we're really excited. We have one country from pretty much every region, from every region of the world. And we have um, regional leaders. And we have countries that are, are really interested in taking on some ownership um, for these issues. So we're, we're very excited about it. And we have a plug-in for how WHO FAO, OIE, development banks, the non-governmental sector, and foundations will actually be able to advise. And this is an area where it is not fully fleshed out. The Finns were here last week to talk to us a little bit about how this could happen. They met with representatives of the non-governmental sector. They met with the World Bank. Um, and so this is an area where, um, in all honesty, we need to, to think more about how public-private partnerships can help to make this successful. And so I would ask you to think a little bit about that. Um, and I'd be very happy to talk with any of you about ideas for how we can make that successful. We also have this group coming together at the end of January. And one of the things that they're going to do is talk about pilot assessments against the action package targets as they exist. So we have targets. They're not all perfect. They are as they were on September 26th. Um, some of them are built on literature and years of data. The field epidemiology training program, for example, is one. one um, some of them are built on best practices. Biosafety and biosecurity is an example. But they're not all perfect. And um, these countries um, have basically made a, so 
At, on September 26th, five countries who are not actually uh, representatives of this, on the steering group, five additional countries decided, made a commitment to be assessed externally and with independent experts against those action packages in order to sort of see how they work in real time. And so we're hoping very much that this leadership group, coupled with that assessment process in January, will be able to sit down, roll up their sleeves, and start talking about how will this work, what kind of support can we get from the public-private community, uh, from the private community, from the non-governmental sector, and from WHO, FAO, and OIE to actually make this work. So I'm out of time. And the, the very last thing I'll, I'll say, uh, this is my last slide, um, is in the G20 context last week, um, just to show that as an, as an economic um, issue, this is really starting to resonate with leaders, the G20 leaders put out a, a, a very action-oriented statement for the G20 on stopping Ebola and also on looking forward at capacity to prevent, detect, and respond. And they committed that interested countries could, would come together um, in May at the World Health Assembly to actually have a timeline for how we're going to establish capacity in West Africa and other vulnerable regions. And so this is another area where we'd really like to work with the private sector and with the non-governmental community writ large to think about how we can achieve a timeline, particularly for West Africa. The U.S. government would very much like that timeline to be within three years um, because we think that it, we really need to focus on getting the countries in, in that part of the world um, up to speed. And we want to work with those countries in the African Union to do that as well. So in closing, um, the biggest challenge that I think we've had in building capacity to meet the IHR has been focused leadership and political will um, and the ability to really focus in on what needs to be done. And so we're, we're hopeful that this effort to accelerate progress will translate into countries having that capacity within the next three to five years. Um, and that we can, as President Obama very rightly said, uh, turn those commitments into concrete action. Thank you.